Hello and welcome to Enchantment of Eternity's a review for New Ground, which is episode 10 of season 5 of Star Trek The Next Generation. This video is a part of a series of videos where I review every episode of Star Trek The Next Generation one episode at a time. In this video, I review the fifth season episode called New Ground, which I am referring to as part one of four of the stretch of boring now the stretch of boring is something that i made up it's not really a thing and uh in other videos i talked about the stretch of doom which is a term my sister coined about a group of maybe six or seven episodes in season two of enterprise that all are like absolutely terrible in a row which i will get to when i get to enterprise and there's also the trilogy of terror which is something that um trek fans have coined over in voyager season three although they picked the wrong three episodes so when i get to season three of voyager i will get to the real trilogy of terror not the fake one that everyone else talks about but uh in this case, um, I'm deeming this the stretch of doom because it's four absolutely boring episodes in a row. Now, I think season five actually has a lot of boring episodes, <laughs> um, which is why I refer to it as one of my least favorite seasons of the good seasons of TNG. Obviously, season one and two are worse, but out of the five good ones, I think this is my least favorite. And it's because there are too many boring episodes. Um, so it's... Um, the stretch of boring consists of New Ground, Hero Worship, Violations, and Masterpiece Society. Now, Violations only loosely fits that term, but I think it was close enough to be boring so I could have a consistent stretch of four. I also wanted to include Ethics and the outcast however they're they're not consecutive they're separated by um conundrum and power play which are in between those episodes and those episodes i'm not the biggest fan of those episodes but they're clearly not boring so i couldn't include that in the stretch of boring so <laughs> and there's probably other episodes in um season five which i also would put in the stretch of boring if it was consecutive maybe like the perfect mate but anyway <laughs> um so yeah so season five has a strong start and a strong finish but in the middle not so good and this stretch of boring has a significance to me because as I mentioned in other videos, um, Disaster, which was a few episodes ago, was the first episode of Next Generation I saw as it aired. Um, so I did see the episodes in between this one and Disaster first as they aired, but... Um, I wasn't really that big of a TNG fan. I was just getting into Star Trek and I was still iffy on TNG. Um, but there was a month and a half break in between um, A Matter of Time and this episode. As there used to be with um, network shows and syndicated shows, there would always be like a month or so break around Christmas time. Um... And so during that time, Star Trek VI came out, which is why I just covered that for my revisited. Um, and I watched a lot more Star Trek, and I started to get more into Star Trek. So by the time TNG came back with this episode, I was really into TNG. Not sort of just half-ass watching it like I was before. I was like going out and buying the mag. I remember buying a magazine that had this batch of episodes starting with the new ground. And, and um, yeah, they used to have a Star Trek Next Generation magazine that would like cover the new episodes like a batch of like four or five and it would have like uh, background information and stuff on it i i wish i would have kept those i would have been more interested in them now but i you know at the moment at the time i was just i didn't really care much about the behind the scenes stuff or i didn't know any of the writers names or anything like that um 
But anyway, um, I do recall, so I was really into TNG when um, these episodes came out, starting with this one, and I remember not liking the new episodes because of that, because um, everything was new to me at the time, because I was just watching the syndicated ones on reruns, and so when I was told, like, oh, a new episode's coming out this Saturday or Thursday, whatever day it was, I wasn't that excited. I was like, no, no, thank you. I'd rather watch these reruns because the new episodes are boring. <laughs> of course, this would change, um, and season five would get a bit more interesting, but there was this stretch of boring where I really did not care about the new episodes and I'd much rather watch the reruns, so maybe that's why it sticks out to a lot to me, why I'm highlighting highlighting it as the stretch of boring, particularly this episode and the next one. And maybe also Violations. Uh, yeah, all four actually <laughs> stand out a lot. Maybe this one more than the others. But yeah, all four of them stand out a lot as... as uh, really boring episodes that almost turned me off to new episodes of TNG. So anyway, <laughs> now all that's out of the way, New Ground is the episode in which uh, Worf's son Alexander comes on board and to his dismay he finds that Alexander is going to live with him permanently as uh, Worf's mother no longer wants to take care of him and thinks that he needs a father figure. So Worf has to struggle with uh, doing his duties and yet being a father at the same time and he also deals with uh, Alexander lying and stealing things and tries to um, punish him for doing that and Alexander doesn't seem to listen so he threatens to send him off to a Klingon school but then there's some accident that happens with the fire and Worf saves his life and then all of a sudden Worf is like okay maybe you should stay here with me and meanwhile, there's some bullshit B plot about some stupid warp wave or some other crap. Anyway, <laughs> so let's. Well, let's actually talk about that B plot first because I talked about this before in other reviews. How there is um, season five is actually probably the worst season of TNG or at least one of the worst. I think it is the worst when it comes to having an A plot that being a character story and a B plot being a useless uh, anomaly bullshit that nobody cares about that's just there to take up time. And Voyager does this a lot as well. Um, and again, if you've seen in my other videos, I talked a lot about how it's different than just having a plot B plot because there's nothing wrong with that inherently, but having the B plot just be there to be in order to have suspense where it's just obviously the writers and no one actually really cared about the B plot. It's just some bullshit like anomaly that is not particularly interesting and is just there to, to, in order for there to be suspense in the episode, and it really stands out, and it doesn't have anything to do with the A plot. Now, I called A Matter of Time was the first episode of Season 5 that I think had that format, although it wasn't quite as bad. I'm still classifying as that, because the B plot was kind of throwaway, but it did integrate into the A plot a little bit and there was a like a moral dilemma that came up because of the, that was somewhat interesting but I still think it classifies um this episode is like the poster child of the kind of bullshit that I'm talking about of having a nonsensical boring ass B plot that nobody gives a shit about that is just there to take up space and to make some suspense and obviously the well the a plot is not interesting enough <laughs> to hold on a, a whole the whole episode because i heard some people speculate like how would you think about this episode if the b plot wasn't there and i would think that it would be even more boring because there's not enough there for the a plot to sustain the entire episode 
is not that interesting of a storyline. Um, so the B-plot involves a warp wave, like where they like shoot out a wave and the ships can just ride it and to go to warp instead of having warp drives. Now, I've listened to other videos that talked about how impractical that would be. Jordy's talking about it, replacing warp drive. Um, actually, Jordy has a really funny line. <laughs> or ironic line where he says that he was so excited about being there for this warp wave test and it's like oh this is amazing we're here it's like being there for the Zeckman Cochran's first warp flight which is ironic because later on in first contact he will in fact <laughs> be there for Zeckman Cochran's first warp flight he will actually be on the flight so that is, uh, that's kind of, uh, funny thinking about it. But anyway, <clears throat> so he's all excited about this, this warp wave and thinks that it will replace warp drive, but that's, that's impractical. Now I can, because you, you just shoot, someone shoots out a warp wave and from one planet and another planet has to catch it. Like that's, <sighs> It's not really practical for ships to use instead of warp drive. I think it might be practical for them to use in addition to warp drive. Like they could use that as as an example of like taking the train as opposed or taking a flight as opposed to driving. <laughs> that if you're going far distances, you you know can catch a ride on the, or something that's well traveled, a route that's like well traveled. But if you want to go off and do your own thing then you're going to need your own warp drive. Um, and so I, I do see that there would be benefits to that. They wouldn't tax their engines as much, and they could like repair and do other stuff while they're riding the warp wave, but they still need warp drive. So I just think they should have phrased it differently in this episode. But it also had me thinking that... I don't know if they stated they did, I don't think they stated in this episode whether or not they used dilithium crystals to create these warp waves. I guess some people would argue that they would have to because the uh, dilithium crystals are um, essential to warp drive, but perhaps they don't. Perhaps this was a different method because it's a wave it's totally it's not warp drive it's totally different so perhaps they didn't use dilithium crystals in which case they could have used these during the burn uh for those who watch discovery they know what i'm talking about <laughs> um that they sh because i was thinking about this because jordy is talking about oh this is a new revolutionary technology that's going to change the face of warp drive and we never see ever heard of hear of this technology ever, ever again. Um, you could say, well, the test in this episode failed, but yes, but it was the first, like, test. They still need to do more tests. Like, they didn't say that the technology was completely invalid in this episode, so how come we never see or hear of this again in the future? Um, and uh, in particular with Discovery with the burn, uh, it seems like the, that would be exactly the kind of workaround that they would need um, during the burn. But whatever. <laughs> the writers just forgot about this episode because it's a useless B-plot. Anyway, let's... Okay, so enough of the useless B-plot. Let's get to the useless A-plot. <laughs> <laughs> now I I like the idea of Alexander coming on board to live with Worf. I think because I talked about this, I like how they have Jake Sisko with Benjamin Sisko. I mean Wesley with Beverly is interesting in theory. They just made Wesley and Mary Sue, and that sucks. <laughs> it's different with Alexander though because he's much younger. And I talked about in Voyager how it pissed me off that because they said that Chakotay had a son and they had an opportunity to do a storyline with his son coming to live with him, but instead they retconned it to be like, um, once they fired Michael Pillar, to be like, oh, that's not Chakotay's son. Like, every time my blood boils every time I hear that line, but I'll get to that when I... Well, I already covered the episode, the basics, but I'll guess I'll get to that in my revisited for it. 
But anyway, um, <laughs> uh, so pisses me off. So I like the concept of, and I think they absolutely should have done it in Chakotay's case, of a son coming to live with the main character. But the way that it's handled in this episode is really boring. Like, they the make the main dilemma of Alexander being lying and and stealing things and I'd like who cares i'm sorry but like that's not enough like that see this a plot should be a b plot to a actually good a plot in which case that would work if there was like a main story that wasn't just a throwaway non bullshit like the warp wave that we never fucking hear of ever again. If we had an actual interesting storyline and then you could go back to this with the B plot, then maybe I wouldn't be as bothered by it. I think it's the combination of having this A plot that is not interesting or doesn't have enough meat to it in order to sustain a whole episode in order to be an A-plot combined with the throwaway useless B-plot that is even by the writer's own admission is just there to take up space and to create some tension in the episode uh, so it's that combination that really sucks but yeah this A-plot should have been a B-plot to a better A plot, in which case I might not mind it as much. But I still find it a bit goofy about. And maybe if it was a B plot, they wouldn't have focused it on focused on it that much, so it wouldn't have been as goofy like with Alexander um, <coughs> lying and that being dun 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 he's lying and Worf having to deal with it. And we get a sitcom trope. The common sitcom trip that was also used in a lot of dramas in the 80s and 90s, but it's such a trope. We're going to send... Worf is like, okay, I'm going to send you away to Klingon school. That is just a stand-in for military school. And that was such... I don't know if anyone you know who wasn't alive in the 80s or 90s or wasn't aware, didn't watch all the sitcoms or common dramas around that time... Is a very common trope wherever uh, they're always threaten the kid who is misbehaving with we're gonna send you away to military school John 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 I was seeing like the worst thing ever and and they would get really upset and be like oh no I can't go to military school <laughs> and so it's basically and the writers even refer to the Klingon school as a boarding school so it's essentially the same the military school boarding schools and they talk it's, it's the same thing like because military schools they, they didn't want to go there because they're so strict and and they're very like have strict rules and and life would be miserable and that's how Worf describes the Klingon school to Alexander it's like they're very strict and blah 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 um why the fuck would he send his son who is a quarter human to a Klingon school and who was raised by humans with humans well his mother was half human yeah, it's a, it was, it's a, it does just just a, it's just it's so cliche and stupid. It's just such a oh, we're gonna send you away to military school, da da da, and then the fire, of course, was just some bullshit to have suspense. And how come, like, Worf is like, no, screw you, Alexander, you're a liar, you dishonor my family, I'm sending you away to Klingon school. And then there's a fire and Worf saves his life. Now all of a sudden, he's forgiven? Well, to be fair, Worf says, like, Worf makes it clear to Alexander that he's in trouble. But he's like, we'll worry about that later. Um, but I suppose you could say, like, Alexander's near-death experience is what made Worf realize that he, his son was precious to him and that he would like to you know, spend the time with him. I suppose you could say that, but it still seems like that the storyline with Alexander being dishonest and lying is completely unresolved 
in this episode. And it just goes away. Not mentioned ever again in the other episodes he appears in. So, what's the fucking point of it? Is my question. Anyway, it's just, it's just silly. Anyway... I guess I gotta talk about how Worf is perceived to be a bad father. Uh, that is a common um, perception of many Star Trek fans. And if we go by what we see on screen, that perception is pretty dang accurate. However, it is actually just a, in my opinion, it's just the fact that Worf is a bad father is just a side effect of bad writing or contrived writing because first of all they didn't want alexander on board at first in the episode reunion they're like oh we can't have Worf having a son on board so let's just have him send him off to the parents to get him off the show and then um in season five, obviously, they changed their minds. It's like, actually, no, it might be interesting to have Worf have a son on board, so let's bring him back. Um, and then they needed to have some tension for this episode, so they had Worf just being... And they wanted to showcase how Worf was unfamiliar with being a parent, yet they focused on that too much and made him come off as a very bad parent, where he's just like, Alexander, blah, blah, and, <laughs> and just the way he talks to the teacher and whatnot, it's just, I just don't like the portrayal of Worf in this episode. But then, on top of all that, like, you do get him building a somewhat relationship with his son in, in this season, and a little bit in season six, and then at the very end of season seven, um... But then, in be once TNG finishes and he comes back to DS9, Alexander is gone again and is saying that he's living. He got sent back to his grandparents on Earth. And, um, and he's not brought up again until season 6 of DS9 when Alexander is magically a teenager <laughs> when he should really be like 7 years old. <sighs> Cleon's age fast. That's just a bullshit excuse but whatever clans don't age that fast but anyway even if they do then it's um alexander's very upset with his father and they've become ex estranged because Worf didn't like keep track of him he wasn't even aware that alexander joined the clan forces anyway i'll get to this when i get to ds9 that's a terrible fucking episode i absolutely hated what they did with alexander there but the point is, um, is that all that stuff combined makes Worf come off as an absolutely shit father who is terrible and abandoned his son. But it's actually due to just contrived writing. Because first, they didn't want him on the show, so they have him send him back to his parents. Then, um, they wanted to portray Worf as un, you know, unfamiliar uh, with being a parent. They overdid it and made him come off as a really shitty parent. And then um, they didn't. They brought Worf back to Deep Space Nine, but didn't want Alexander on that show, so they had him send him back to his parents. And then they decided, oh, let's bring Alexander back, but make him be in the Klingon in, uh, soldier, which makes zero fucking sense that's the last thing he would want to do but they just did it because they wanted to have a, this plot with him on the Klingon ship and so that made Worf an even terrible parent so yeah and there's a, a lot of people that make all these jokes about how Worf doesn't give a fuck about Alexander and that's kind of fair but it's yeah it's a side effect of bad writing you know contrived writing it's because they wanted to do certain things at certain times and they didn't give much thought about how they would accomplish that and so they made Worf look like a terrible father in order to do that now to be fair <clears throat> there are some good episodes with Worf and Alexander coming up like I think cost of living is a good one um Fistful Data is, is pretty good as well as far as their relationship. It's not a pretty good episode, but it's pretty good as far as their relationship. And then Firstborn 
This is a really great episode about Worf accepting Alexander. And that would have been great if they just left it that that. But then they had to have Deep Space Nine come along and, and they totally fucked it up and made him be a terrible, terrible father. So it's bad writing. This is what I'm saying. So I don't know if I blame it much on Worf, but then again, Worf is a fictional character, and all we know of him is what we see on screen, so even though it is the result of bad writing, that Worf is a bad father, <laughs> regardless of how what the cause was. But anywho, um, there was one good scene in this episode. Um, Counselor Troy actually does her job well in this episode which as i talked about and throughout my coverage of tng that's not always the case usually the writers don't really know how to write for her and she comes off as useless or not particularly good at her job but in this episode she's really good at her, at her job i like how um she's always interested in uh wharf and she's like very excited <laughs> that alexander's coming on board and tries to help wharf through it but then she that one scene where wharf is talking to her i believe in her office about how alexander is stealing and and he wants to send him away to klingon school and the way troy talks with him is so good uh it's like one of the best scenes of her being an actual counselor and like where she says that um and it's also a really nice call back to Kalar where he says are you angry at Kalar for dying and leaving you with Alexander and he's like oh well, of course not but she's like it's okay to be angry it doesn't mean you love her any less um and that was a really, like, nuanced scene. It was really good writing. That was just... And so it did make the moment at the end where Worf is like... Because Counselor Troy was suggesting maybe you should work through your, you know, your pain together instead of just sending him away again. And then at the end, Worf is like, I have a challenge for you to stay with me, but it will not be easy. And then um, Alexander's like, I accept your challenge, Father. Which was kind of touching, to be honest. Because it was earned by that earlier scene um, with Council of Troy. So that is the one sort of bright spot in this episode. Is that this, it's rare where they can use Troy correctly and use her well. And so it was good seeing that. But other than that... Uh, the episode was really useless. So now I would like to thank my Patreon supporters for supporting me on Patreon. It's very much appreciated. It does help me continue with the channel, and I'm very thankful for all those that support me. I'll have to give a very special thanks to Brandon Neil House. Thank you so much for all your support throughout the years. Very much appreciated. Um, but I would also like to give a shout out to Antarius, Greg Marley, Francisco, Chuck Hooks, Kyrie091, Anthony D. Benedictus, Ricky, Manny Jester, Joel Lavals, Alessandro Miglacio, Norman Buckwald, Stephen Kennedy, Brenton Berg, and Allison Fordyce. Thank you all so very, very much for your support. So, got a few patron comments on this episode. First comment is from Kyrie091, who says, New ground? More like you ground. I don't remember this episode at all, even a little bit. I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts and how you would have liked how you would have liked it if Vic Fontaine was in it. <laughs> oh yes, that is just what this episode needed. Is uh, not enough to have a stupid throwaway plot about Alexander lying and them sending it off to military school and then some bullshit B plot with some wave that we don't care about. Let's also throw Vic Fontaine in the mix. That would definitely make it better. <laughs> anyway. Next comment is from Stephen Kennedy, who says, The two writers for this episode wrote two other episodes, and one of them was The Wounded, and the other one was even worse than this pile of garbage. Stuart Charno was one of the writers. He started in my... Uh, uh, favorite slasher movie Friday the 13th part 2 Ooh. 
Uh, Deanna Troy was great again in this episode. When Worf finds out that his son is trapped, he stands there like a complete moron and then asks Picard, can he leave to save Alexander, his only son? Someone should call family services and take Alexander away. So my rating is three. Worst father of the century goes to Worf out of ten. Now, to be fair, Worf was on duty on the bridge. He can't just fuck all, even if his son's life is in danger. Like, he can't just, he's one to be, uh, he's very dutiful. He's very, like, takes his job seriously. So he's not going to just fuck off without, um, without Picard's permission. So, yeah, he was a bit unsure of what to do at first, but then, once it came to it, he's, you know, went to, said very hurriedly to, um, Picard was like, you know, um, permission to, to go, to leave the bridge, and Picard's like, go. Um, so, I, I don't know, I think you're maybe being a little too harsh on, on Mr. Worf here. Um, so, while I'm talking, I'm trying to look up the writers because I'm trying to figure out what the other episode of that is that's even worse than this one because you didn't say what it was. Um, one of the writers only wrote w this episode um, for TNG, and, but they had credits and um, shows like The Outer Limits wrote a lot, bunch of episodes for that one, which is really interesting now i'm looking up the other writer okay this must be the one you're referring to did the wounded and ethics was the other episode oh you think ethics is worse than this episode i'm not sure if i concur with that but we'll see when i get there anyway um uh, let's see uh, Stephen Kennedy also said, I forgot to mention that the Enterprise wanted to go space surfing. I wonder how many simulations did that gobshit do before he did a live run. Worf should sue this wanker for almost killing his burden of a son. Then he should sue Worf for being a terrible father. <laughs> Space surfing, that's, yeah, that's a nice way to put it. Anyway, next comment is from Norman Buckwald, who says, An Another anomaly B plot. Yes, it is related to the A plot by making an in danger at risk of Alexander in peril for Worf to rescue for the uh, Pauline trope, but that's very loose in this case. Very, very lame. I agree with Steven that Troy is excellent. She always is when she is a therapist, especially for children in the series. And aside from uh, a few moments in the past, the only basis truly of a character development of both uh, that could make us uh, in an alternative timeline, not necessarily this one, of how Worf and Troy could be together. Though the special interest of Alexander and Worf not knowing what to do as a reluctant single parent. Given that, Troy at best was better off as a friendship of Worf who is in the seventh season a version of her agreed to be guardian to Alexander. As for Alexander, uh, Bunsall is I guess okay as a child actor enough compared to most in Trek and having him uh, be unruly, which may be how a model young Klingon may be like, is truly viable, especially since he has a unique trauma background, seeing his mother die in front of him. Still, Alexander shows signs of being annoying, and it is that excuse that Stephen Shies uses to dismiss Worf's record as a very poor father when he declared him the best Klingon, not Martok. Still, while we could excuse Worf as he's suddenly in this role at this point in the series, seeing how Worf finally was he is only slightly better as a parent. 
uh, than, say, Seven of Nine's parents of each app. Yes, I said it. Three bad parenting and only showing to be a hero clue to B-plot anomaly of the week out of ten. Okay. So if you disregard Star Trek Picard, Seven of Nine was a good parent. I mean, she had some moments of <laughs> fun is scheduled now. Fun will now commence. <laughs> but that was actually just funny stuff. But overall, I think she was a much better parent than Worf. I'm sorry. I will have to say that. Um, even in Picard, like, that's not her fault that, that Egypt got his eye ripped out. I mean, he was a Starfleet officer by then. And she did, like, go out of her way to avenge him for that. And she mercy killed him, which was absolutely heart wrenching for her to do. So, no, I don't think that she's a terrible mother. I think Worf is definitely a worse father. But again, as I said, that's a result of bad writing. Um, yes, and and Troy is absolutely good in this episode, as I talked about before. Anyway, uh, next comment is from Ricky, who says, This episode sucked. I'm sorry, but this episode is boring, and I would say that this is Alexander's worst episode in TNG. Yes, even worse than the Fistful of Datas. It's an interesting concept that Worf's son would come back, and that he doesn't get to run away from his fatherly duties, and I totally buy when Worf adopts when Worf's adopted mother mentions this, and that she and her husband say that they are too old to raise him. But I didn't like um, what I didn't like is that Alexander was acting like a brat, and that he lied. They made a big deal when he was lying. Also, this episode is very slow. Poorly paced. I feel like this episode shouldn't exist. If anything, this should have been a B plot and not a whole episode centered on this concept. So my rating is a three out of ten. Um, I actually didn't read this comment before, so when I mentioned that I felt that this storyline should have been a B plot of a, another episode, I didn't realize that Ricky had said the same thing. So. We're really, uh, really always on the same page, or most of the time, because <laughs> I, you know, I absolutely agree with everything you said in here. That this episode is worse than the Fistful of Datas. I think it is possibly. I don't know if it's his worst appearance because there's rascals, but that wasn't an Alexander episode. He just had a small role in that episode, so you can't really blame him for rascals. But um, so this is probably the worst episode that focused on Alexander, but there weren't that many of them, to be fair. Um, but yeah, I totally agree that this, this sh might have, I might have liked this plot if, if it was a B-plot of a better episode. Anyway, uh, last comment is from Antarius, who says, The scene in the teaser, when all of a sudden Jordy was overexcited about the uh, solution wave, was an example of bad exposition and overacting. This episode was a little bit better than I remembered, but it's still rather poor. What a great coincidence that all of the rooms on the Enterprise, uh, this specific room is somehow not protected by the shields, although the room does not seem to even be uh, outside of the ship. I always wondered how uh, civil transport, which was used by Alexander and his grandmother, is organized in the Federation. Do they have big companies with regular lines and schedules? Are there tourist cruises? My rating is a 5 out of 10. I think that there are, that makes sense that they would have like, that it would be like flying a plane and they would have like schedules of transports that would go to um, regular like Federation planets. And because if you notice, like um, Worf's mother said that, oh, when I heard you were going to be in this sector, I took the transport to come over and meet you. So in other words, like usually the Enterprise is out like exploring and is out in unexplored like non-Federation space. But, um, Apparently, since it was doing this, you know, stupid test run with this wave, it was in Federation territory, so they were at a 
place where um, she could actually catch a transport to. Uh, I didn't think about all this, but yeah, that's and so I think that they would have luxury cruises and stuff. But bear in mind that Federation doesn't use money, but they they would still have this kind of thing. Um, so yeah, I think that it would exist. Um, as far as the scene with Jordy acting over excited, I'm sorry, but to me that's the least of this episode's problems <laughs> if i'm being honest like i i you know you're probably right that it was kind of a bad exposition but I, the, everything else in this episode was so much worse i didn't even notice anyway thank you um patrons so much for your comments so we had let's see I believe well Kyrie zero nine one <laughs> didn't really make give a rating um, but other than that we had one two three four people give ratings out of ten and three out of four of them gave it a three out of ten and so again uh, simpatico really on the same wavelength because my rating for new ground out of ten is a three very poor. Um, I was very tempted to give this episode a 2, actually, but uh, the Troy scene was really good, as I mentioned, and that's enough to raise it to at least a 3. <clears throat> and, you know, and that made the ending where War says we should face this together a bit good as well. But, other than that, this episode is completely valueless. Um, it had a throwaway B plot nonsense. It had uh, exaggerated Alexander stealing, which was so uninteresting, and um, and it just made the silly cliche plot of "Oh, I'm gonna send you away to boarding school." This time it's a Klingon school instead of military school, but the same fucking thing. Um, and so you combine those two things, the boring B-plot, the boring, the A-plot that should have been a B-plot, then you have, like, one of the most boring episodes out there uh, with one good scene where Troy's actually written well, which doesn't happen that often. But other than that, yeah, this episode's quite terrible. So that is it for my review of Newground. So let's see what's coming up next on my channel. Thursday uh, will be my review for Hero Worship. Uh, Saturday will be my review for Violations. Um, Sunday, uh, hopefully, either Sunday night or Monday morning, will be my review for the second episode of Season 2 of House of the Dragon. And then on the following Tuesday, we'll finish up this stretch of boring with my review of The Masterpiece Society. So that's what's coming up on my channel. Be sure to check it out as I continue to cover Star Trek Next Generation and do many other Star Trek videos and many other videos as well. So be sure to subscribe so you can keep up with all of that. And thanks a lot for watching.